after the basics, your mask and fins, most divers invest in their own regulator. And there are quite a few benefits of owning your own regulators. So the first is, is that you know exactly who's ever spat in it. Rental regulators are used by many, many divers day in and day out. And trust me, very few of them are properly cleaned between uses. Rental regs are obviously used a lot more than the manufacturer originally intended as well, and whilst they are often serviced more frequently than just a standard recreational regulator, they can still develop faults over time, but of course you'll be the one to discover that fault. Buying your first regulator can be fairly daunting because it isn't always as simple as just picking a size and a color on a website. Regulators can come in what's often referred to as stage four sets, which is great, where basically everything is picked and assembled for you, but more often regulators come in separate parts that you or better a technician has to assemble. But not all regulator parts are actually compatible, and even once it's assembled, it may need some tweaking to make it work properly. Regulators are a big pressure balancing machine that takes 300 bar of gas in at one end, it then regulates that down to 9 or 10 bar and fills the hoses with that. Your second stage then holds off that 10 bar of gas pushing its way in and releases a little bit in as you inhale. But both the first stage and that second stage need to be in balance and need to be adjusted together because if the pressure the first stage is pumping out is too high or the valve on the second stage isn't strong enough, then your regulator is just gonna leak. But anyway, let's look at what to look for when buying a regulator. The first thing that you need to decide is what your regulators will be for. Obviously, they're going to be for scuba diving, I know, but you need to decide if you're going to be a warm water traveling diver who wants a lightweight, compact set of regulators, a tough cold water regulator that's really heavy and dialed up so it won't freeze over, but it's harder to breathe from, or some kind of Goldilocks middle of the road regulator that can dive in cold water, but isn't too heavy so you can still travel with it. You also need to decide what management or hose routing style you want, and this is largely down to your training agency and your style of diving. Most regulators straight off the shelf will be fine for a standard single cylinder recreational setup with a primary second stage on a fairly shortish hose, an octo on a longer hose on your right hand hip, and a gauge on your left hand side. But if you're diving a long hose primary donate setup, for example, or just anything else, then you'll need to mix that up a little bit. If you'll be diving on twins, then you'll need two separate first stages. The same if you're diving on side mounts, but then your gauges will need to be different. So you need to decide what kind of diver you'll be, or at least plan to be, because some regulator designs can actually restrict your future setups. If you buy right the first time, then it's pretty easy to upgrade your regulators later so that they work for you as you progress instead of having to buy a brand new set of regs because your old regulators were just holding you back. The most important thing when buying a regulator set is that you've chosen all of the bits that you will need. Most regulators will come in about four separate parts. The base part is the first stage and your primary, then you add an octo onto that, and then a pressure gauge, and finally any low pressure inflator hoses that you might need for BCDs and dry suits. If you're also planning on actually buying a BCD or a dry suit, then these usually come with an inflation hose from new, so double check if you even need to buy a separate low pressure inflation hose or if one actually comes as standard with the other bits and bobs that you're buying. When assembling regulators, technicians will build what's put in front of them if that's the only input they have. We can usually tell kind of what you're going with uh, sort of based on the sort of parts that you've purchased, but if you miss something out, for all we know, you intended it that way. So when you're buying your regulators, it's best to talk with someone to make sure that you have all of the bits and bobs that you might need and the right bits too. You then of course need to tell us how you want them assembled. As I said earlier, without any other input, a technician will just kind of assemble the regulators to just standard setups. That is, second stages on the right, gauges and LPI on the left in a single cylinder setup. If you're aiming for something else, then let them know. Regulator technicians are amazing people, but they're not mind readers. 
The first stage is the clunky block of metal that attaches to the tank. This is what's doing most of the work and it is what you should really want to spend more time focusing on when buying a regulator instead of the second stage. There are about four different shapes of first stage and these define their use and their configurability. Spoke design first stages are cheap, but they kind of limit your hose routing options, so they're best left for just single cylinder setups. Upright first stages, they're fine for single tanks, but again, they kind of limit you if you want to change to anything else. But the most flexible are five port swivels. These kind of allow for pretty much any hose configuration you need without any awkward bends or twists. So if you think that you'll ever move on from a standard recreational single cylinder setup, then look for a five port swivel turret first stage. The fourth design is just kind of specialist, uh, but these are either for twin cylinders exclusively or sort of inflation tanks for dry suits. And by that stage, then you're getting one regulator that does that one job really, really well because you know exactly what you need. The main part about all of that and the different shapes of first stage is basically where the ports are located on that first stage. Each port on a first stage is somewhere that you can put a hose, either a high pressure or a low pressure. Most regulators have two high pressure ports for gauges and transmitters, and four, maybe five low pressure ports for second stages and low pressure inflator hoses. Now you can't mix these up because high pressure hoses are a different size to low pressure ones, but you can only fit however many ports are on your first stage. And finally, when you go to buy your regulator, you'll be given the choice of DIN or A-clamp. A-clamp has quite a few names, uh, sometimes it's yoke or international, but yoke is the original fitting that clamps over your tank valve and then seals on an O-ring that's fitted to your tank. DIN is a much newer fitting that's actually growing in popularity and is pretty much standard for most places now because it's a lot safer and it's also a lot lighter for travel. DIN actually traps an O-ring on the inside of the cylinder valve so it can go to much higher pressures and there is minimal chance of it failing but some areas are a little bit slow to update their tank valves. If I'm recommending which, I'll always go with DIN. It's far safer and I've never had any issues with it and I've never heard of an issue with DIN valves compared to A-clamp, which do slip O-rings from time to time. The primary is the second stage that you actually breathe from and it's usually attached to the first stage straight out of the factory. Your primary is usually your fancy second stage because it's the one that will be used the most, so you'll often find extra little features worth noting and of course looking for when you're buying a regulator. The first is adjustment. Look for breathing adjustment and venturi adjustment. If it looks like your regulator has a knob on one side, a little twiddly bit, then it's probably for breathing adjustment. And what that basically does is adjust how easy it is to open that valve and let that 10 bar in from the hose. Dial it all the way out and it will be very, very easy so you don't have to inhale very much at all to get any air. But this can make that regulator a little bit flighty so it free flows at the drop of a hat. Or you can dial it all the way in which makes it much stiffer to breathe in. This makes it harder to free flow but it does mean that you have to suck a little bit harder to actually open that valve. If you're worried about free flowing, then that's what your Venturi lever or pre-dive switch or whatever the manufacturer calls it is for. A Venturi lever is a simple on-off switch that changes the direction of airflow inside the second stage to help prevent a free flow. If you want a smoother free flow, then turn it off, but with it on, it will help prevent a free flow from ever developing. Some second stages now have an automatic venturi uh, where airflow controls the direction. So basically when a regulator starts to free flow, it just fixes itself automatically. Other features worth looking for is the thread on the actual inlet to the second stage. Most second stages have a universal 9 16th inch thread size, so you can fit pretty much any regulator hose to it. But there are some second stages that have unique fittings, um, so sort of replacement hoses uh, can actually be tricky or expensive to find. Other than that, look for heat sinks, uh, sort of bits of metal and uh, sort of fins that help the regulator work in cold water without freezing up. And also look at the mouthpiece. Some regulators have different size mouthpieces and you can't always mix and match and fit any mouthpiece to any second stage. 
Your octo is the brightly coloured cousin to your primary second stage. Many divers just opt for the cheapest octo that they can find, but bear in mind that your octo needs to match your first stage. They have to be the same brand, first of all. Otherwise, a technician literally won't assemble them because the combinations haven't been tested and certified and they may not work correctly. If anything happens to your regulators and you've been mixing brands, then this can actually void your warranty. Gauges and LPI are fine, you can sort of fit whatever brand gauges or a low pressure inflator hose, that's fine, but second stages have to at least be the same brand and sometimes only certain combinations of octos and first stages only apply. Depending on your training agency, your Octo will usually be just a yellow version of your primary on just a slightly longer hose on your right hand hip so that you can just donate it in a jam. Octos will usually have all of the same features and specs as the primary, but they just have brightly colored sections on them so that they can be seen. But they're usually also assembled to be a little bit stiffer too compared to the primary so they don't just free flow whenever they see the water. You can save some money on an Octo if you really need to, but of course we recommend that uh, you basically get the best that you can afford because it's a safety device and a safety device isn't really something that you should try to save money on. Remember that your Octo may not be just for your buddy. It could also be you using it in a jam. So do you really want to use the cheapest regulator you could find in a pinch? And personally, I use a second primary as my Octo if that helps you make any decisions. Look for very similar features in your Octo, uh, but a Venturi switch is probably the most important feature to look for when you're buying an Octo. Standard gauges are either singles, doubles, or triples with a pressure gauge, a depth gauge, and a compass. Uh, you just kind of pick and choose which of those you want. Single gauges are an essential analog backup so you know and you always know how much gas you have left in your tank. Uh, single gauges are either compact gauges in either a, a actual physical boot or uh, they're just kind of loose on the end of a hose or they're brass gauges. Personally, I prefer a brass gauge because they're tougher and they're also built to a higher standard. Uh, personally, I've had a couple compact gauges just pop and leak before, so now I only use brass ones. As modern technology improves, we also gain new ways of using tank pressure data and wireless air transmitters are just that. If you have two high pressure ports on your first stage, then you can fit a transmitter, which is a battery powered beacon that fits to your regulator and just sends your tank pressure data to your dive computer wirelessly. These are great because you only have to look at one screen to see all of your dive information and most dive computers will actually convert your tank pressure into minutes of air remaining so that you can better plan your dive. It's always recommended though that you keep a backup analog gauge. If your battery dies or you lose communication between your transmitter and your computer, then you lose everything. So you basically need to know how much gas you have left. Depth gauges and compasses are also useful backups too. Dive computers have all but replaced depth gauges and many computers actually have digital compasses built into them too, but they're still battery powered and they can fail. I still dive with an analog compass on my wrist as a uh, analog backup because it can never run out of battery, it just can't. You can always dive an integrated dive computer on a hose, but the same problem. If the battery runs out, then you lose everything. So you don't know how much gas you have left, how deep you are, and how long your stop is. The material that your regulator is made from is very important. Most regulators are just made from chrome plated marine grade brass, which is great for regulators because it doesn't rust, it regulates temperature pretty well as well. You can also find some titanium regulators which are much much lighter and they're a lot stronger so they're great for traveling, however they're more expensive, uh, they don't do well with high oxygen mixes and they don't do well in the cold neither. So, keep it to warm water diving and not particularly rich nitrox mixes. Second stages are often made from plastic, uh, which is light, but a metal body second stage is a massive heatsink and it's a lot tougher too. 
plastic second stages can be damaged over time, especially when tanks fall over onto them, but metal ones are usually pretty tough compared to the plastic alternatives. The big chunk of metal helps to keep the valve from getting too cold, and they can also help with you with your dry mouth. Moisture from your breath can actually condense on the inside of a metal second stage, so your next breath isn't as dry straight out of the tank. Owning your own regulators is great because you know what condition they're in, but you also have to keep them serviced so that they work properly. Regulators are fitted with dynamic and static O-rings that all get old and they go hard and they can even crack at times. Diaphragms and other sealing surfaces just wear out over time and they need to be replaced. So much like a car, your regulators need to be serviced every year or 100 dives, whichever comes first unless you're teaching, in which case it's every six months, but you should really know that by now. Some regulators have been designed to extend that service interval from one year or 100 dives to two years and even three years in some circumstances, which cuts maintenance costs. Look for service plans too. Some manufacturers offer some kind of service plan or service warranty as long as you have your regulator serviced every single year at an authorized service center or get some kind of annual inspection at least. So that way, if you're stuck between two different regulators, but one's a tad more expensive, then consider the service interval because you might actually save yourself a fair amount of running costs over the years and five years down the road, that cheaper regulator that you saved a few quid on may end up being more expensive in the long run. Once you've chosen your regulator set and all of the little components, then actually double check to see if it will be assembled or not. Uh, it's not the most complicated thing in the world to actually assemble a set of regulators, but it can often require unique tools and procedures. For example, marine grade brass is great for heat transfer, but it's also quite a soft metal. So if you wrench in a hose a little bit too tight, you can literally strip the threads and just ruin your entire regulator and you gotta buy a new one. Even if you can fit the hoses to the right torque, when you pressurize it, the Octo might leak because it's never been pressurized to that first stage before, so it might need a little bit of adjusting. And that is another thing that you shouldn't be fiddling around with if you don't know what you're doing. If you've done a regulator technician course and you know what you're doing inside a regulator and you have all of the right tools, then you should be fine assembling your regulators. But if you don't, then I'd get someone to assemble them for me. Just bear in mind that they may need another tweak after the first couple of dives as regulators can bed in over time. So regulators, which regulator did you end up buying? Um, what was the sort of reason that you chose that regulator in particular? Let us know in the comments below. Thank you for watching and of course, safe diving. The pool dive. So dive masks range from like, I don't know, $20 to 200, and there are real tangible reasons as to why. So whilst your budget should define your range of choices, should you save up a little bit more just to buy a fancier mask? Let's take a look at what to look for when buying a mask.